Man, Dan Blixley, as we crossed the French coast, he said, guys, I gotta go back. My engine is acting funny. So anyway, I was coming up over the car, and that thing just went on me. But after I had experience, you know, backfiring and this, and it appeared that at the time, out of the 12 cylinders, maybe six cylinders were operating, or four, or five, or six. But it was coughing and moaning and yawning. So just as I was coming over the car, the car down flat, you know, it was the heaviest I have ever seen. I, on my edge quit, I gave May Day, and then after my third or fourth May Day, my radio quit. I crash landed. I decided not to really try to make to the English Channel because if I had been out, the wind, they had north wind at that time, by the way, the wind would have brought me over the car and the guys would have practiced on me. And it was the period where the Germans were shooting anybody coming down in a parachute. B 17 boys, you should have seen them, you know, coming down in a parachute and they got down with a the guys, you know, just strafing the hell out there. Anyway, that in mind, you know, I was kind of scared and so on, so I decided to go southbound. And now, the crash landing is really complicated. I describe it in the book very, very nicely. And I'm not going to go through here because I don't want to take the time. Anyway, I crash landed there and I was standing on the wing when I crash landed because what I had attempted to do was to bail out at 2,000 feet, not high altitude. Now, I got an aircraft without an engine, remember? I trimmed the aircraft nicely, I blew up the canopy, I, stuck, I, tried, I got up and I tried to stop on the wing, but my dinky cord, the dinky cord that you connect to the main west, I have forgotten to connect that when we left. <laughs> we were in a hurry. One of the great mistakes a firepower can make. So when we were tumbling over Bordeaux, you know, evidently that thing, uh, the, the plug got stuck somewhere below my seat there in something like this, you know. So as I stood up, I said, the plug, the plug. Pull the, I tried to pull the plug, nothing coming up. I tried to pull the plug. In the meantime, the perspiration and the fear was all over me. I sit down. I sat down back there, you know, and I came left and right, and finally I disconnected the goddamn thing from wherever, wherever it was trapped. I connected it to my main west. Too late now. I wasn't going to be over the channel. But anyway, I connected to the main west, you know, I got up again and the wind was blowing me back. I stepped out on the right hand side and what I had in mind, I had never done that before, put the right, right hand by the d ring and count up to 10, you know, and pull the thing and wait for whatever is going to happen. Thank God that I looked up there and I can see cattle, cows all over the goddamn countryside, farmland where I, I was coming down. Had I really left the aircraft, the parachute would have never opened. Or it would have opened exactly the moment I stopped the ground. So I stood right there, you know. I thought of trying to get back in the cockpit, you know, and with my parachute on, you know, I, I thought I, I would destroy the stinger, you know. So the aircraft was coming just straight down, and we just missed the roof of the only barn in that farmland area. And as I passed the far, I, in fact, you know, I reached inside and I pulled the stick back a little bit to miss that roof there. But I, by doing that, I probably killed whatever speed I had, because on the other side of the, of the barn, the right wing came down, struck the ground, and I was thrown between the stack propeller in the air and landed somewhere there. How long I stood there, I have no idea. Two German soldiers came in later on while I was preparing to put fire on the aircraft. They fired at me and they scared me and dropped everything and I began to run into the forest. I got into the forest and that's where I was. For five days, I wandered all over the countryside. I drank water from running creeks, I ate grass, and thank God, I was grown up in dandelions. My mother used to make dandelion salads, and I found those goddamn wild dandelions. I picked them up, put them in my back pocket, and I washed them, you know, as I was going through the running creeks. The underground picked me up five days later. I had a problem with that now. This guy, a lieutenant colonel of the French Secret Service, but underground man, Stefan. You probably are glad, not like I'm here again. He said, well, so I told him, I said, uh, I, I was not born in America. I said, I was born in Athens, and I went to America when I was 18. Ah. So he wanted to know more than about rank, serial number, and date of birth, and so on. He asked for my father's name, and this, and that, and that. That's how they were really operated. Why? Because before the war, 
German families with youngsters went to Germany to visit the grandparents. What do you think Hitler did when the, or the Gestapo when the war started? You think they left those American boys to come home? Uh-uh. They used them. In fact, they had a capture B-17, I was told, by the underground, flying, and the guys jumping out with American uniforms, dope tags, impersonating to be American crews so they can penetrate the underground. And who on earth is helping 10 people from a crash B-17? We cannot find the bodies, and we cannot find them. Who are they? Where, where are they going? Who is helping them? This is what they were using. Anyway, so I gave all this information to this guy, you know, about my father's name was Nicholas, my roommate's name was Gentile, the aircraft that I crashed with, Martin's QPD, and uh, about a couple of days later, he came into the room with a goddamn bottle of Bordeaux wine. <laughs> Stefan, who talked to London, here at Spar, yesterday evening. Talked to London, we know who you are, the flying Greek. You know, in squadron, they always call me the Greek. They never really use my call sign. Greek, watch this. Greek, watch that. Greek, let's go get these guys. You know. Anyway, so uh, I was one in the family. I spent six months in occupied France. <laughs> they, about 10 days or so later, they moved me to Paris. You know how they moved me to Paris? In a truck loaded with firewood. The driver and another guy here, a gendarme in civilian clothes. And I was in the middle. I could give him fake papers. Jean Claude Goyer was my name. A mechanician, a mechanic. That uh, during the war I was with the heavy artillery and I had lost my hearing. So if anybody asked something, you know, I'd say, what? What you say? What? Guess you say? You know, things like that. Anyway, I didn't know it. But while we were driving on the highway to Paris, my friend, the gendarme who spoke some English, he said, uh, Stefan, là-bas, beaucoup mitraillette, machine guns, underneath the goddamn firewood. If you remember, the RAF, later on, we were going to do the same thing, made air drops in the underground, at different places, at night, to the OSS guys, to different people. Now, how do you take those weapons to the underground in Paris. You can't just walk with them. That was one of the methods. So when he told me that underneath that firewood was mitraillette, <laughs> I wanted to say, stop the car, I'm moving out. <laughs> but I, anyway, I live with 16 different families in Paris. The last family, the last, there were three guys. The biggest saboteurs the underground had, and I don't know if you gentlemen remember, but General Eisenhower said in his book, if it wasn't for the French underground, the invasion in Normandy could have had a different face. They were good, I and mean, the saboteurs, and I took part with them. The first exhibition I had with them was an air drop. We went at night, and I was holding one of the flashlights. They make a triangle way up there, one guy with the flashlight, with the funnel, so the light will go up, not that way. And they get him to hold this flashlight, you know, when they did the signal, I turned the light on, for this, uh, not like a, a, a Halifax, yeah. one of the RAF uh, bombers came in at night and dropped weapons, radios, medicine, what have you. That was my first experience with this book here. Then we went out to derail a train the train, this is just before Paris was liberated, about the 20th, the 20th of August 1944. Paris was liberated the 26th, 27th. What the Germans were doing, they took all the prisoners from this Furness, prison southwest of Paris, including a big number of Jewish people, taking them to Germany. So the underground evidently found out through their intelligence, you know, the train was the part of such and such time, was going to Nancy, northeast of Paris, and then into Germany. That's where we met another group, and by that, we took the rails. We, did, we took about uh, half a dozen rails. We didn't live in there. Another group you know, was making ditches down there where we buried the rails. But don't you know it? 
the French engineer, the then locomotive engineer, he must have been clever. The moonlight of the Delhi signed the track, as you can see, you know, when the moon is at the... And then he discovered that there were rails missing. And he stopped the train just before it came out of derailment. What did they do? They went behind the train, removed tracks, were a rapid in front, installed them there, and they began to move. We were watching them from a the hill way up there. But by the time they got to Nancy, another group <laughs> blew up the locomotive, and you should have seen the people escaping. And of course, the Germans, you know, with the machine guns, probably killed a good number of them. Anyway, the other episode I uh, tangled up with one of, of my group here, they got information that the Germans were going to use military trucks, about seven or eight of them, to transport stolen property that they were taking from hotels, houses they were renting, to Germany. And they were going to depart at such and such, such night. So our group got the information. We joined up another group, first northeast of Paris, and we waited around the bank. They gave me an automatic rent, British rent automatic. And I have also 38 in my pocket. They told me, you know, if you see anybody, buy when the signal is given. Now, how do you stop the convoy? At night, especially. Mm -hmm. Because the Germans prefer to drive at night, not at daytime. They have prepared spikes. Visualize a small pyramid with a platform, sharp. You put your finger up here, you know, and you, if you were not careful, you were able to cut it. That's how sharp. So they put around the bend. Not on a straight road, around the bend, every maybe two feet or one and a half or so, cross the road here. So as the truck comes in at high speed, one of the wheels is bound to hit one of those. That's exactly what happened. The first truck, you know, hit the goddamn thing. The driver lost control. He went to the right there. The second truck collided in a small explosion. And you should have seen the other guys coming out. I must have really put down six Germans that night. I saw the bodies up there, and I, you know, I followed that guy down there. And then we had to wait until it was a mess. We killed every one of that convoy there. The trucks were burning, and then, of course, we had to get back and hide in a farmhouse, in the barn of a farmhouse far away from the area there. Anyway, when Paris was liberated, I was there. When uh, Eisenhower evidently worked out to allow General Leclerc the German general, the French. French general, you know, to walk into Paris with his people, so the French people would say, "Hey, I liberated." <laughs> but it was Uncle Sam, I, and his people, and we. That's right. Anyway, I was lifted back to England, and I was told the bad news: "Goodbye. You cannot fly in combat anymore. You're going back home." So I was assigned to right field. I had a good assignment there. I went to this Bible school. I began to fly airplanes. I was after after finishing test pilot school I was selected with my buddy Gentelli who was there also and we did the service test of the YP eighty at Newark. Tony Lavier checked us out and I looked off there. But I quite feel I had a chance to fly the ME one oh nine, the FW one ninety, the ME two sixty two and the zero. Hmm. Then hmm. I had an, ex an experience, I'm not gonna go through it. A P-63 I was testing with water injection at 35,000 feet over Cincinnati blew up on me. The engine just blew up. And immediately I released both doors and declared an emergency and I had to really do something, even jump. But you know, in, in test pilot school, they, you know, they stop and say, now, when you're testing something and you run into a problem, see if you can bring it up so you can find out. <laughs> <laughs> right there, Bud? Oh, yes. <laughs> so anyway, so I landed the guy down in dead stick. I won't have I landed the dead stick, but I liked, I, I was really coming in too fast. I didn't want to be short. I'd rather be close to the runway and uh, to hit with the distance. So I landed about halfway down the west runway at right field. I locked the guy down brakes, and I remember the tower called me. Aircraft on the runway, both wheels are on fire. The fire truck, the ambulance, and probably the priest, you know, were following us all the way. So when the aircraft stopped outside the runway there, I jumped out and got down the fireman there, 
they were trying to put the fire off the wheels there, the smoke, whatever it was. And they covered me up with, oh, they blind me all over the place. They took me to Patterson Field at the hospital there. They cleaned me up. But in the bomber section, there was a captain, a lieutenant colonel, Jim Philpott. He was a TWA yeah. captain on military leave. He was trying to recruit pilots because he knew that, hey, everybody's going to come out. He had talked to me and he said about joining TWA. So anyway, uh, Big Ball, uh, Gentile, no bigger than uh, Bob Hoover was there. And uh, what, the rest, of I think they too. They came in the hospital to find out what, what happened. What happened to you? So I, I told them, you know. And then after they left, you know, Jim Philpott came in and he said, hey, buddy, I got a big 26 and going to Kansas City and I need a co pilot. I said, Jimmy, I'll find you too. So, <laughs> so I went to Kansas City. I joined TWA. I spent about two and a half years with them. I learned a lot. I flew in county. Uh, as a co pilot, I never got checked out as a captain. I got uh, some 800 hours. I got the airline transport license. And, uh, but then, life as an airline pilot at the time wasn't really happy. We had three furloughs and a strike by the captains. And I said, I've done it. You know, my buddy Gentile was at the Pentagon. I called him and said, Dad, I'm going to LaGuardia to Washington National. Meet me for coffee. And he went for coffee and I told my complaints and said, You want to get back on active duty? But Dad, I said, I don't have two years at college. The Air Force wants two years at college. In the meantime, you know, the Air Force had just left the Army and became independent. You know, they went to Euro College. Yeah, I said, but you got something that the Air Force will give a million to have you. I said, what do you mean? Jet time. I have over 100 hours, you know, jet time, test time. And at that time, you know, you could really count the jet pilots, you know, the Air Force had in your fingers. My God, he said, I'm going to send you an application, but don't send it to channels, you send it to me. I did that, I completed the guideline application with the airline transport license, they sent that to jet time so much. And ten days later, by direction of the President of the United States, you are recalled to active duty, report to the Pentagon. I was happy. Report to the Pentagon, we got a regular commission. And funny, the application for regular commission at the Pentagon, and I got promoted to major there, then, had it had it uh, called general officers, you serve on it? I said, General officers. General Spatz had retired as chief of the Air Force in the Lima Georgetown. I really took the liberty and said, well, I'm, I'm going to get permission if I can really get his name on it. <clears throat> so I called up and his, my, his wife uh, answered. I said, Is the general? No, he's not in. I said, Ma'am, I said, This is uh, Captain Pisano. So I said, You know, I'm, I'm applying for a regular commission and I had uh, the application. I said, I had the information or if I knew of any generals. And, I had met General Spatch when he came to our station, you know, and visiting us, listened to our conversation while we were fighting the Luftwaffe. Oh, she said, you know, he'll be here this afternoon. Why don't you come by? I said, thank you, man. So I got the address. I went to the floor shop. I got me a dozen of uh, red roses. <laughs> I took it to the lady. I walked in, and there was the old general, you know. And I said, General, yeah, I said, I remember you. You are the fellow with the accent, he said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He and Doolittle and Kepner and everybody used to come to Depton, to our station, because, hey, we were the most experienced guys, you know, in the Army Air Force. You know, and they, they liked the way Blexley was giving briefings and, you know, what we were doing. Anyway, oh, he says, by all means, sir, you put my name there. I got the guy by regular commission. Six out of the Pentagon were given a regular commission out of 200 throughout the country. And I was one of them. I got promoted to it. Anyway, I was happy to serve Uncle Sam there. I served in many places. Germany, I served with NATO. I went to, I was in Germany for the second time when I volunteered to go to Vietnam. And when I went home to tell my wife I was going to Vietnam, she said, what on earth are you doing? Well, you got two children here, I said. I know, but Uncle Sam, I said, the man who helped me really be what I am is in trouble in Vietnam. And I am a soldier, and I think I have to go there. Thank God, I thought for a moment I was going to really have a goddamn divorce in my hands. But thank God, I didn't, and we just passed our 63rd anniversary, and we're on our way to our 64th with the same woman. Anyway, uh, then I went to Vietnam. And actually, I volunteered to go and I got down F-4 unit. And I had orders when I left Wiesbaden to report to William Air Force Base. 
and get checked out on the FO and they go over. In Kansas City, now I don't leave, I got a goddamn telegram. Your assignment to Williams has been canceled. You're to, you're to report to Seward Air Force Base in Tennessee to get checked out on the C-5. The C-5 is the caribou. Two engine, the Haviland built, it was really built by Canada for the Army. And the Army had it for a while, 200 aircraft, but they didn't know how to operate it. And Mr. McNamara decided to give it to the Air Force. Anyway, that's a different thing. Uh, I got to Vietnam. I became the operations officer since I was a senior lieutenant colonel. Then later on, I got hold of the, they gave me command of the squadron. And uh, I completed 200, 375 missions mm -hmm. in Vietnam, supporting the special forces. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I had missions in uh, Laos and uh, Thailand, where we gave ammunition to people, not the military people, but the CIA. They were operating there and we had to take ammunition. Anyway, I finished up my tour in Vietnam, and I was in Kansas City, and I was supposed to be assigned to Vandenberg Air Force Base, the only position they had for a lieutenant colonel. My wife liked California so much, you know, and uh, so uh, I got a telegram, your assignment to Vandenberg has been canceled, <laughs> you have been promoted to colonel, and you are to report to the 308 Ballistic Missiles Wing at Lindenmark Air Force Base as Deputy Commander for Maintenance. I knew nothing about the goddamn missiles. <laughs> but I learned they sent me to a special school where I had majors, captains, and sergeants teaching me, the only student, teaching me about the, the uh, uh, not the Atlas, the, uh, the other missile. Anyway, uh, it was very enjoyment assignment. Then, from that assignment, after I had really become familiar how to really help, don't you know it? SAC and the JCS had a requirement. Once a month, the wing commander with three, the three deputies and the vice commander would sit down in a locked room, patrolled by military police, and review every target that each one of those 18 silo missiles was assigned to. Mm -hmm. You don't, uh, you probably not remember, but in Little Rock, I think throughout the country, we had some uh, funny guys, you know, they thinking about this and, you know, getting hold of a missile. And they felt that, is it possible that one of our own might say, Moscow? Let's go to London. You will change that. This is the reason that SAC you know, required that. So the wing commander would have to review. And I want you to know, I saw with my eyes some of the targets we had. Now, of course, those missiles are out of the inventory. Moscow, Leningrad, Odessa, and the bombs that we carry on those missiles, Titan II missile, by the way, the bombs that we carry on those were not the bombs we dropped in Japan. They no. were hydrogen baggers. One of them will just make the entire city of Moscow, you know, go to town. Anyway, I got a call one day from the Pentagon, from a colonel who was in charge of generals and colonels assignment. Sanos, how would you like to go to Athens, Greece and be the chief of the Air Force mission? Say, so, wow, well, who is this? I said, you, you're pulling my leg. <laughs> I'm not pulling your leg, he said, you know. But I said, wait a minute, colonel. I said, the SAC spent big money, I said, to train me. That's okay, he said, you know, the SAC doesn't owe you, I own you. Anyway, Arkansas really came back to me. I, you, you see, you know, I was really good friends with Arkansas. And I got the assignment there. Diplomatic passport. I went to Washington. I was briefed. Air Force Intelligence, CIA, DIA. Not to be a spy, but to have this and this wide open. Because the Russians had about 150 agents in Athens shadowing NATO. <laughs> They didn't care about the Greek army or the Air Force. They want the Americans and NATO to find out what on earth they have for us. You know, and so I was told, you know, just listen to because you want to participate in many, many episodes, you know, that will be important to us. Your contact is the Air Attaché, a colonel by the name of Jim French, who became the French. 
I didn't go by name on those conditions. I had a number, 514 was my number. <laughs> I'd like to tell you, I had it in the book, you know, and the publisher, he said, you better remove that because the CIA will be in your, in your, uh, in your feet or in your back. Mm -hmm. What it is, let me tell you right now. Every so often, you know, I had $5,000, by, by the way, uh, allowances per year to spend entertaining the chief of the Greek Air Force, other military, and what have you, in a diplomatic uh, area. So this time, the French, the uh, Jean French, the, the attaché, you know, was given a beautiful uh, garden party. And every time they could hurry from the air attaché business was there. I was wearing my white dress uniform with my collection here. And uh, all of a sudden, the Russian naval attaché, a commander. Ah, Colonel Pisano, he said, you are a hero of the American Air Force. He came just, I, I, was, I was talking to the Italian and the German uh, attachés that moment, the three of us. Oh, he said, let me congratulate you. We must get together, Colonel, he said, and have dinner at my home, at your home. Please, you know, oh, and then he walked away. Oh, the German guy made a funny remark about the loud voice, you know. The following day in my office, who in the head walking? The chief of, chief of the CIA, the station chief. <laughs> Steve, he said, has your, has your office been there? Uh, uh, I well, said the last week, I said, I have somebody from the embassy there and checked, everything's fine. Okay, who closed the door? He said, I was at Jim Fretch's uh, house, and I saw what the Navy, Russian Navy commander did to you. We want you to have a dinner at your house, or even, not his house, but your house, we prefer your house, <laughs> and see if you can arrange to have the Russian guy to sit down with one of our boys who speaks <laughs> Russian better than the Russians. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, my thoughts went back to Washington. You know, I said, hey, I guess this is something that, anyway, he left, you know, he says, you know, he told me, not being part of the game. Uh, so immediately I called up Jim. Jim, I said, are you free? Yeah. I said, uh, how about walking to the park? We had the Royal Gardens <coughs> in Athens, a garden uh, that uh, they have been for the king, and it's still there today. And uh, every time we had to really uh, talk something, we, we take walk in the park without anybody nearby. So I told him, <coughs> oh, God damn it, he said. We gotta go to Washington. He went to Washington, Washington came back and he said, number four, 514 is not, repeat, is not to be involved, so and so and so and so. You see, the Russian naval commander, our people, had found out from Washington if they really had to the people in Athens, had been passed over for promotion to captain in he had expressed a desire to leave the service and go to America. Why? He was a nuclear submarine commander. That's why the CIA, you know, wanted to see this guy, wanted to have the guy. So anyway, uh, and then we discussed with Jim, he said, Washington felt this way. Look, you are working, trying to sell the F-4 to the Greek Air Force, you know, and if the Greeks find out that you're not a colonel, you are a CIA guy. Goodbye. You know, they're not going to talk to you, and believe me, I, had, I was just like that with the chief of the Air Force. He was my boss in Naples when he was a lieutenant colonel and I was a major serving in NATO. And also, you know, the prime minister, Spiro Agni, when he came to, 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 to Athens, we had a big syndic in the, in the, at the Hilton Hotel, and he introduced me, the ambassador introduced me to Spiro, and uh, of course, Spiro, you know, said, hey, what? You were born here and you went to America and look what you did, he said. So, and he, they introduced me to the Prime Minister. And it was the Prime Minister whom I convinced to buy the Air Force that I was really <laughs> selected to go to Athens. I sold two squadrons of Air Force to the Greek Air Force, 300 plus million dollars. And what I did, I told him we have tested the Air Force in Vietnam. The French with their Mirage and the British with their Jaguar have not done that. The Air Force can carry the atomic bombs, but that doesn't mean that America would want you to do it. That's our job, I said, if we have to do something with the Russians. And further, 
Washington has told me to tell you that we're going to support you for the next 20 years. This was 1972. To this day, they fly the Air Force in Athens today. I had to brief the chief of the general staff, an army four-star four general, in Greek. The guy didn't speak a word of English, but I did depart from other side. Let me close here now and say this. After, of course, Athens, you know, I we decided with the wife and the children to go to retirement. So I was going back to the States. Not by a, a freighter this time. <laughs> Let's see. In a constellation in the first class, because the station TWA monitor and I was a good friend of mine. And every time I flew TWA, he almost woke up in the first class. <laughs> so here I am, going back to my adopted country now, here with a diplomatic passport in my pocket where I don't have to worry about immigration or anything else. They admit me and escort me in order to go my way. Anyway, I went on retirement, but I'd like to say this. I am proud of the success I found in America. And I am proud to have become a citizen of this great country. What America did for me, I keep deep in my heart. Because there is so much to be proud and grateful for. Uncle Sam gave me the opportunity to become not only an aviator, but beyond that. I never really dared to dream that someday I would be wearing the uniforms of two great air forces, the British Royal Air Force and Uncle Sam's Army Air Force, where I attained the rank of a colonel in the regular Air Force, not in the Reserve Air Force proud to have completed three prestigious schools. The Air Force Test Pilot School, where my friend Pat here joined up later on, the Air Command Staff College, and the Air War College. To earn a BS degree from the University of Maryland while attending classes at night, while I was at the Pentagon. Collecting a number of Accommodations, wards, and decorations from Uncle Sam and four other countries. Accumulating close to 8,000 hours in some 85, 90 different type aircraft, drug driven and jet propelled, including a fighter, the F 106, where I clocked some 1,500 miles an hour. That's what is the speed of sound. To me, that was a great achievement when you consider that I had learned to fly in a J3 car. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was able to really accomplish all this because of the opportunity given to me by Uncle Sam and the American people when I first came here. And my gratitude to this wonderful country is too great to express to you how I feel in my heart about the United States of America, your country and my adopted country. America, my friends, is the greatest democracy on this planet. A country that believes in freedom, opportunity, equality, and promise. A country worth loving, serving, fighting for, and dying for Uncle Sam and the American flag. Thank you. has uh, some copies of his book, The Flying Greek, up here, if you'd like. I've already got uh, one of our guys has already got them. And we'd like to give you just something. you probably got a ton of these. But this is one of your former mounts, a P-40, as uh, photographed by one of our professionals here. And we're very proud of this work. I flew that by Truthfully, you know, when I was in to you and I was flying this in the 51A, I preferred the Mosler because this guy here, you know, you have to really taxi fast and take off. If you had to wait out there, for, that dug under a light it would come up, engine's too hot, you have to shut down the engine and wait. I did, that's why, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yes, I've got a question. Yes, You said you went from the P-40 to the Spitfire. Will you just give me a, your evaluation of both of those aircraft? Oh. Compare them. Okay. 
GP4 as I said, one of the things that I didn't like in order you know, was Putin. But yet well, the boys of the, uh, in, the, in the Pacific, you know, did okay. Uh, but uh, the Spitfire, you know, was beautiful. You could really defend any city. And if you ask me, you know, okay, we go to defend San Diego. And you have the Spitfire, the P4, the P47, the Hurricane. Which one would they like? Street fire. Because it was designed, you know, for that particular purpose. Now, if you said, we have a target in San Francisco, we're going to take the B-17s up there, and we need to you know, escort I'll take the 51 with the Rolls-Royce engine. Because the P-51 with the Rolls-Royce engine could operate high altitudes, up to 40,000 feet, low altitudes, can turn as good as the street fire, but it had the ability to fly away. Thank you very much. My question that I have a little bit. We did have the Imperial Division in the P 51. Yeah. Did you ever fly one of them with the engines that they put in the bridge? With the Allison? Yeah, he flew the Allison. Yeah, I flew the Allison. Early on. Oh, yeah, I flew the Allison. The Allison was good up to the P 51 with the Allison engine was good up to 10,000. After that, you know. It wasn't really. Uh, that was just the plane. But you see, the P-51A was designed for the Army Air Force here for low level. But the guys in Washington says, we don't need that. What do you, what do you think about the aircraft? The RAF. Because they were dreaming, you know, we need to have an aircraft, you know, that can do do better. Any other questions? No, I'll take one of books. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> we want to keep one if we can from the library as well, because Katrina Tescador is going to do it. So we're, we're going to stake one out for Katrina, and then uh, tell them. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> we're going to make sure Katrina will back to buy this from you, and she'll tell you how to sign it. Okay. Okay. Is this your talk today? And, uh, and more. No. You went down? No. Is this what where you spoke? Yeah. To? Yeah. But uh, but the details are here. Oh. I cut down details. You know. Because, uh, Luckily, that's all I want. Give me that chair, please. You know, you know, I have a kind of. Oh, so there's two there's something. Yeah. Okay. Some people are going to be in my first and last week. Oh, I said that they go check me out on the 38th. That's right field. Check it out. Oh, yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. Not many people can say, okay, your oh, copy is here, but you still have to pay for it. Yeah, and I don't want it. There you are. Okay, I got it. Do you want it signed? I want it signed. Did you okay. okay, well then you know, you'll have to join the happy throng, but I think that's wonderful. I guess right here, I guess. I guess I can turn off the camera, huh? At this point. <laughs> Thanks. Did, did you get it all, uh, Katrina? I am hoping I I had to report to the head of the Office of Space Sciences. Who was that? George, I had was to that George Mueller? Uh, no. Space Sciences was a gentleman named John Noggle, okay. Dr. John Noggle, and the head of the Apollo program at that time was Rocco Patroon. So each of them had a staff meeting every week, so I had to attend both staff meetings and uh, try to, if there was any difference of opinion between the two, my two bosses, I would occasionally have to mitigate it. Uh, anyhow, interesting. Well, let's take you back to, to that time period. I mean, in the 65 to 67 time period when you were um, basically director of Apollo Lunar Exploration Office, you saw the early Apollo tests coming along. Did you think at any point between uh, that some of the mission decisions were were too rough? I mean, I mean, here we were, here we were, we had just had the Apollo fire, and we lost Grissom, White, and Chafee. And they're saying the second man mission on, we're going to go to the moon, Apollo 8 around the moon. Did you think that was, how did you find out about that? How did you react to that? I found out on a golf course. <laughs> really? <laughs> Don't lie. Sunday morning, I, I, maybe it was a Saturday, I was playing golf. And uh, I was about halfway through the round. And uh, the... 
pro came out, mm -hmm. one of the pros came out and said, which one of you is Shara? And I raised my hand and he says, you're to call home immediately, bring your golf bag. So I jumped in the cart and we went back to the pro shop, me thinking one of my kids has been run over or the house is on fire. And I got back and called my wife and she says, you've been told to report to NASA headquarters at 11 o'clock. And it was then about 10.30. Oh boy. And I rushed to NASA headquarters. Do you remember what month this was too? How late it was in the Apollo planning? Was it August or was it earlier than that? Or seemed like I, I, it was in the summertime. It was in the summer, okay. And I went back and the head of Apollo at that time was uh, General Sam Phillips, who later became a four-star general. He had three stars at that time. One, a wonderful guy and if you want to name some, some I've been asked, what are the, what, name three people most responsible for a man's first landing on the moon and I, I said, uh, George Lowe, uh, who picked up the Apollo program in Houston after the uh, fire, and uh, Werner von Braun, the father of all launch vehicles, and, and Sam Phillips. NASA headquarters. Sam called, we were, three or four of us were lieutenants to him, and he said, gentlemen, we're gonna take Apollo 8 to the moon. <laughs> we were open mouth. He says, uh, President Johnson has just made that decision. Uh, was it John? Yeah, it was Johnson. Well, I'm not sure. One of the, the president has just made a decision this morning that we will take Apollo 8 to the moon. We ask questions like, we don't even have a landing vehicle that goes to the moon. And he says, I know. Man has never flown on a Saturn V. He says, I know. And uh, are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yes. So NASA then made a, the hardest decision, I suppose, technically, in their history. They decided to take the first launch of Saturn V with a person in it and take it to the moon. And Apollo 8 did that. And the three astronauts orbited the moon. And on Christmas, Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, they broadcast back from the moon and read from the Bible. Uh, those three were, uh, let me see. Uh, Frank Borman. Borman was the commander, West Pointer. Uh, number two was Bill Anders. Number three was uh, uh, Blaine. No, it was Captain Lovell. Oh, Christ. Yes, it was. <laughs> and it was Captain Lovell. Well, Lovell now is, runs his own company called uh, Consultant Firm. Mm -hmm. uh, Borman became head of Eastern Airlines. And uh, and uh, Anders was a Naval Academy man who became CEO of General Dynamics. Uh, so they went, they went far. That those, that trio. They've done, done an incredible job. I, I think you know Bill Anders is retired and down in this area, and uh, and Jim. I, from what I understand, Jim Lovell sponsored his son, his youngest son, to get a restaurant in uh, Chicago called Lovell's. So I, it's just I, levels. So. Yeah, just levels. <laughs> Anders is now retired and lives in San Juan Islands and oh, has yeah. a spot here in San Diego. Oh, okay. And uh, he Frank's. owns, uh, last count I had, 12 airplanes. Wow. But he's a brilliant uh, man in many respects. But what he's done with these 12, 
He, he started a museum in Washington, in Washington State, and uh, keeps his 12 airplanes there. Then he opens it up to the public. So the uh, since, since he does that, it's a tax write-off for him, and he gets to fly any of the airplanes he wishes, and he does things like fly in at Reno and other places. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it pays for his upkeep. Security is covered. Yeah, that's true. And he's got his airplanes safely uh, in the hangars. Smart. Very smart. Very, very smart. Yes. Well, well, let me let me take you back one more second section because I'm curious. Where were you? Where were you? Um, and what were you doing uh, during uh, the time, the period that you heard about the Apollo? AS-204 fire, the Apollo 1 I had, fire. I had come back to NASA to run into the Lunar Orbiter program, right. and I, uh, I remember parking my car and listening to the radio, and they announced the fire. <laughs> Bad day. Yeah. Well, let's move forward. I mean, a lot of decisions, I'm sure, were changed at that point, but let's, let's move back. We've successfully uh, had Apollo 8, and... Richard Nixon has stepped in as president now, and uh, we've done the Apollo 9 test, the Apollo 9 capsule being here at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Um, did you feel that we were rushing it? Immediately the next flight was going to be 10, and we were going to take the uh, gumdrop and spider, in this case it would be Snoopy and Charlie Brown, uh, down to, to uh, nearly the surface. Were we rushing at that point? Did you feel that we well, were doing well? Well, we had well? planned... Uh, we all had planned uh, a step-by-step -step. and uh, initially as I recall the step-by-step -step program would have Apollo 12 landing on the moon Pete Conrad mm -hmm. uh, but the Apollo 8 leapfrogged some of the steps and uh, if I go back up a minute, when Apollo 8 went to the moon, the Russians never again tried to send man to the moon. We had won that race, if you want to call it that. Uh, so, uh, Apollo 9, Jim McDivitt and Dave Scott uh, had to test the landing craft. Mm -hmm. Uh, deploying it and so on. Along with Rusty Schweiker. And uh, that's a spacecraft that's down here at the Spare Space Museum. Uh, and uh, then Apollo 10, Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan uh, went up, orbited the moon, and then just uh, was sent down close to the moon's surface, mm -hmm. but that step was to determine uh, flying qualities of the landing craft. And then they came back up and uh, were on the boot again. So that was a necessary, believed a necessary step. And between an eight and nine and 10 with 11, then we said it was decided that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin would land, yeah. uh, which happened. Now, um, back to the, the some of the just critical decisions of 11. Um, were you, where were you in the flow chart for 11? Did you have anything to say about landing sites or, or um, crew selection or missions? Uh, nothing to do with crew selection. Uh, Landing site was Houston decision. What's the safest place we could find? Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with science or anything. Uh, I was re in under my he just was uh, the experiments, and Apollo 11 didn't do a whole lot except walk around and pick up material, mm -hmm. which came back was brought back and then deposited in the, what was called the Lunar Receiving Laboratory at Houston, mm -hmm. uh, where 
is still being studied by a variety of scientists who are trying to, de to determine the origin of the moon, and there are two schools. One is it was captured as it went by, and, and the other is it was a piece of the earth that broke off. Last I heard, they still haven't decided that. Mm -hmm. So on 11, you know, you were uh, the director of Apollo Lunar Exploration Office at that point. You basically you decided that I think it was Site 2 was going to be the safest um, there in the Sea of Tranquility. What, from what I understand, though, they landed five miles down range. So was there any uh, nervousness in your office that, that possibly they had landed somewhere that they, we couldn't, we had to try to figure out where they were going to come back to? At that point, in the, in the rendezvous and docking procedure, no, we had we never had any intention of going back to the same landing site. Uh, On that, the, taking but, off. But it was really exciting in that uh, they were running out of fuel, mm -hmm. and uh, so we were watching that very strongly. I was an observer down in Houston, really sweating that, and uh, and suddenly the computer. Computer indicated uh, uh, false readings or uh, readings, mm -hmm. and a young man in the, in the back room said, "I've seen that before." Continued. That was Bales, right? Yeah. So they continued, and they landed. Neil found a spot that he thought was safe, and it was, and he landed so gently that it did not compress the landing struts. It was so gentle, so as he came down the ladder, uh, was later, uh, he got to the last step, and it was about three feet, and uh, so he had to, had to jump. <laughs> he held on the rail, but he came down on the landing uh, pad, and that's where he stood when he said, he put his foot boot out, uh, stomped on the surface, leaned over, he had a camera right here, leaned over and took a picture of it. Mm. And I have that picture hanging on my wall with a uh, uh, nice citation from Neil, my pride. Well, that's, that's, eleven was successful. When they brought the then they brought the samples back to Houston. They actually got the samples ahead of you know, C one forty one and landed in Houston beforehand. Were you at the that the lab when they cracked open the? Uh, no, that was all being done by. Uh, they were put in quarantine. Mm -hmm. Put in a special trainer, a trailer. I mean, and. Uh, it was decided they would be quarantined for 30 days. Mm -hmm. uh, I was asked one time uh, by a reporter, why 30 days? And my answer was, that's how long you do it when you don't know what you're doing it for. <laughs> there were a lot of people saying we're bringing back some germs from the moon. Mm -hmm. And President Nixon went down and talked to the astronauts to a wind in the trailer. On, on the USS Hornet, right. And congratulating them. So, that was a, a big day. Well, um, 11 is successful, and you're coming up to decisions uh, about 12. And who is it that suggested, well, let's go back to the Surveyor 3 site in the Ocean well, of Storms? I, I, I don't know whether I originated, but I suggested that. Yeah. And uh, others may have suggested the same time, but but I had been uh, a manager of the surveyor. At, at one stage, I was from, moved from the lunar program to no, I was made head of all lunar programs, which there were only two. Yeah, <laughs> surveyor and and uh, so the surveyor had landed in 1966, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it, so it had been on the moon for four years or some time. 
and I suggested in the meeting, let's land by surveyor and we can uh, inspect it and bring back pieces of it and determine the flux of me micrometeorites on the moon. So that, that idea uh, was accepted. And as I say, I'm not sure I was the only one who thought of it. So Pete Conrad landed close to it mm -hmm. and he walked over and he uh, first as he came down the ladder he had to jump and he's a short fella about five seven I guess and he jumped and his first remarks was it might have been a small step for Neil but it's a hell of a jump for me <laughs> he went over to the surveyor cut off the camera mm -hmm. and brought it home and uh, Experts studied the, the marks on the camera to determine the momentum of the energy of the micrometeorites and determined the big prop question was can, uh, can uh, our suits, if the suits have punctured them, the astronauts on the surface would be dead. Mm -hmm. So they determined from that test that the suits were strong enough and we proceeded. That's awesome. I think we'll, we'll hold up at this point because it's been uh, about two minutes short of that hour and we'll take a break here. And